thanks everyone for being here, and uh, hopefully everyone had a great conference. Uh, I know that uh, we went through a lot of things uh, for the past couple of days. Uh, my name is Ray. I'm a developer advocate for the Google Cloud Platform. Uh, one of my job is to bring some of the best technologies that Google has to offer, both the, the products and the open source projects, to the Java developers all over the world. And I love to make that Java experience the best experience for the Java developers when you're using Google Cloud Platform. Uh, I'm also a Java champion, and if you have any questions, please, please uh, contact me on Twitter at Saturnism. And today we have a special guest as well, uh, Josh. Go for it. Hi, everybody. My name is Josh Long. I'm a Spring Developer Advocate on the Spring team. I'm an open source engineer and a contributor. I have the dubious distinction in my 10 plus years contributing to the various Spring projects of being the number one top ranked, most visible, most prolific, most highly lauded, most acclaimed contributor <clears throat> of. Um, uh, of bugs, but still number one, number one, number one to all the projects to which I've been a contributor. There's that. I do training videos, I do books. I just finished my latest and greatest book called Cloud Native Java, which is all about how to build applications that survive and thrive in the cloud in terms of Java and Spring Boot and Spring Cloud and Cloud Foundry and all these other great technologies. And the book is something about which, I, which, about which I'm very proud. It's a book about how to build applications do, that do the right thing in the cloud. And it did take a little longer than we'd expected it might take. It did take just a little longer. We thought, given our privileged position within the community, we'd have it done within six Six months, no problem. But it did, in point of fact, take just a little. It took a little. It, okay, it took two years. All right, it took two years to get this dumb book out. And there's a big reason for that, right? And I, I lay the, I lay the blame uh, for that tardiness, that delay, uh, at the feet of the intense deliberations that went on between us, the author team, and the publisher O'Reilly. We spent an extra 18 months deciding upon the animal for the cover. Now, anybody who knows anything about O'Reilly books knows that it doesn't all that much matter what's in the book proper. It has everything to do with what's on the animal, what's the animal is. So we eventually settled upon a blue-eared kingfisher. It's a bird that is indigenous or native to the Indonesian Java Islands. It's a bird that is indigenous or native to the Indonesian Java Islands. And birds fly, yes, through the clouds. So it's a bird that is, in, that is native to Java that flies through the clouds. It's a cloud-native Java uh, bird. It's a bird. Never mind. It'll come. It'll come. <laughs> Give it time. And at Pivotal. Uh, I am a, 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 just like my friend Ray, Ray here, I'm a Java champion, and we care about helping developers. Yep. So uh, as you may have probably seen for the past couple of days, we have so many different services and products you can actually consume and use. We have everything from compute, running your application, to services for machine learning, to big data processing, and all of these things. Uh, one of our goals is actually to make this the easiest things to access uh, for Java developers and also for Spring developers as well. So one of the goals that we had was to provide one of the best integrations uh, for Spring and Spring Boot to consume and use GCP services. And we actually worked really hard and together uh, between Google engineers and Pivotal engineers to provide this new project, which is called Spring Cloud GCP. It is an open source project. You can find it on the, uh, the Spring Cloud organization on the GitHub repository. Uh, and we worked really hard to make sure that it is idiomatic for the Spring Boot development and that it's easy to use. And uh, why don't we just get started and show you what we got? I think we should. All right. Yeah. I'll take the lead if you don't mind, my friend. So go for it. Let's, uh, we're going to build a new application today. And we're going to do so at my second favorite place on the internet. My first favorite place on the internet, of course, is production. I love production. You should love production. You should go as early and often as possible. Bring the kids. Bring the family. The weather is amazing. It's the happiest place on earth. It's better than Disneyland. But if you haven't been to production, then you can begin your journey here at start.spring.io. If you need inspiration in the early morning before a cup of tea or coffee, start.spring.io. If your children are restless and can't sleep, start that spring that I owe. And if you suffer from indigestion after a long night of alcohol abuse and PHP, start that spring that I owe. So we're going to build a new service called the reservation hyphen service. And this service is going to take advantage of Spring's web support. Uh, we're going to take advantage of uh, the JDBC and MySQL support. So we got that, JDBC. Uh, we're going to use Actuator for observability. We're going to use Lumbach to make Java just a little bit less like Java, a little bit less tedious, if you will. There's a number of other supported languages here, not the least of which is Kotlin, but you can also choose Groovy. Uh, we're going to choose, uh, what else do we need, my friend? Well, we are going to be running this application and then using GCP services, so you can actually add GC support. There we GCP are. support as well, yeah. All right. Uh, and I think that's it. That we need web, web MySQL, JDBC, Actuator, uh, Spring Data REST. Data REST repositories, yep. OK. There we are. So that's a number of selections for now. That'll get us started. We'll add some more things as we need to iteratively. Let's hit Generate. And that'll give us this new project that I'm going to open up in my IDE. So here I am in the downloads directory. I'm going to unzip and open. That's a little alias that, that just does that for me. 
I'm going to open this up in my ID, and any ID will work just fine. I'm using IntelliJ. How many of you use IntelliJ? I'm just curious. How many of you use Eclipse? Also good stuff, hot sauce. How about NetBeans? Yeah. NetBeans, Emacs, Emacs, very cool, awesome. So we have a, a number of options here. Uh, we're going to build a simple application, and we're going to start this off with a sort of like an enterprise use case, an application that's talking to a SQL database. Now, can you see that font? That should be legible, yeah? Good, OK. So we're going to talk to an application that has some SQL in it. Uh, and to do so, we're going to take data out of a, a database, read the data into DTOs that we're going to modify or manage here on the client. So we're going to have a, a DTO, if you will, that just reads data and uh, prints the data out. So we're going to have a, a, a simple object with two fields. And I'm going to use Lumbuck. Lumbuck is this compile time annotation processor that will synthesize things like the getters, the setters, the two string, the, arg the constructors, et cetera. It will do all that stuff for me through these compile time uh, pro these annotations. Now, uh, I'm going to write a thing. I'm going to write an, uh, an object that's going to run when the application starts up. And so in order for it to run when the application starts up, uh, I want Spring, which is my framework that I'm using here, to uh, call this run method. It's going to see that my object, which I've annotated with that component, <coughs> implements the application runner interface. And it's going to give me an opportunity to do whatever I want when the application starts up, passing in the public static void main string arguments array. In that, in that object, I'm telling Spring to inject the collaborating object, this JDBC template, which is a, an object I can use to talk to SQL-based databases. And here, I'm going to say, <coughs> this.jdbctemplate.query, select all from reservations, all right? And uh, when I get the results back, I'm going to map each row that comes back into an entity of type reservation. So there we are. There's my application. Uh, and I'm going to say for each result set row, RS, let's get the ID and, uh, and the reservation name and turn it into a new reservation. So rs.get string reservation name. All right. So there's our entity. Now, of course, this can be better written with lambdas in Java 8. There we are. Now, that API, uh, this J the API we're using, the JDBC template, is very powerful. It's been in Spring since 2001 or so. So it's been around forever. And you'll see here in the comments our very own Thomas Risberg, among many others. Thomas Risberg was a, a main contributor to this code, this, this class, over, the, over a long period of time. And the result of this is a collection of reservations. So I'm going to say query dot for each, and I'm going to print out the results. So system out print line. And there we are. There's my results. Uh, now, and when this application starts up, I'm going to need to uh, have a SQL schema that I can use, and I'm going to need to have some sample data. So I'm going to tell Spring Boot to initialize the database by running the script called schema.sql. I'm going to create a table called reservations when the application starts up. Uh, and I'm going to initialize it. I'm going to say you're going to have an ID that's going to be uh, big int not null auto increment primary key. And I'll have a field called reservation name reservation name. It's going to be var car 255, not null. <clears throat> now, I want to be able to delete this. I want to make sure I delete it when the application starts up, if it already exists. So I'm going to say drop table, if exists, reservations. So there we go. That's going to create the schema idempotently. And then I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to now initialize some data. So I'm going to say data.sql. And here, I'm just going to insert some records into my database so we have something with which to work. So insert into reservations. Reservation name, values, Josh, and we're going to have Ray, and we'll have some of our friends. All right, there we go. So there's our, uh, a few of our friends uh, in, the, uh, in the application. So now we have four records that we're going to write when the application starts up. I need to tell uh, Spring to run this, this script when it starts up. I need to tell it to run this script when it runs up. So I'm going to say initialization mode equals always. And uh, there we have it. There I'm done, right? I, uh, I'm, I'm all, I don't have to do anything else. I mean, I, I, I'm missing one little thing, it occurs to me. I'm missing. Yeah. Uh, where, where's your database? Yeah, well, I hadn't, I hadn't really gotten around to that, man. So you, you don't have it on your local machine? No, no. no. All right, <clears throat> that's OK. But you do have a Google Cloud uh, project, don't I you? do. All right, let's yeah. go there and check it out. OK, so yeah, cloud.console.console.cloud.google.com. OK. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, very cool. So you are in the project. Why don't we go and find Cloud SQL? So uh, you do have a Cloud SQL instance, which is great. Uh, this is our managed SQL database, right? So you can actually create a database that has uh, either MySQL or Postgres. Why don't we click into it? Now, there are many different ways for you to connect. Uh, one of the ways that you can do it is by using the IP address down there. But you don't really want to do that because that is a public IP. So rather than doing that, one of the best ways to connect to it is by using the instance connection name. 
And in order for you to use that, uh, what happens behind the scenes is going to um, create a new JDBC URL that actually configures a special uh, SSL socket factory that will actually interchange the certificate for you in order to establish a secure connection to the backend database. Now, in order for you to have that functionality, one of the easiest way is actually by using our starter that we built for the Spring Cloud GCP project. And once you have the starter in the dependency tree, then you can actually just configure it. So there should be a configuration called the instance connection name that you can refer to. Yeah, there we go. So just paste that in. And then you're going to specify the database as well, uh, which is the one that you created. Uh, I think it's uh, if you go up, if you go to databases right there, uh, that should show you the database you have in the instance. And it's called reservations. All right. So Very that cool. should work, right? I mean, that should be. That I, should I, be all I need, right? I think that's it, yeah. OK, so, let's give it a go. Let's see what happens. Try it out? Yeah. Like, live. <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> what could go wrong? Who here thinks this would just work? Oh, wow, nobody. No confidence really? at all. No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, let's take a look. So it is connect. It is running. And oh, my goodness. Did you see that? Just that scroll by? There it is. It worked. Of course it worked. It's a demo. <laughs> what were you expecting? Instead, uh, we have this. But let's focus on this for a second. Notice that we have all these different connections here. All these different connections. This application has got a whole bunch of connections to talk to the database. So we can tune uh, the connectivity uh, parameters here in the same way we would anything else uh, by specifying uh, properties on Spring Boot's data source configuration. Here, I'm going to say I want to have a maximum of two threads. All right, so when that's going to restart, we should see that we'll have considerably less output on the console when the application starts up. Uh, but that is working. We're actually talking to a database in the cloud. Uh, we can see that, right? Is everybody uh, see that here? Not, not from here. Not from here, no. Yeah. So there we go. We've got the data. We've got the database. Uh, we've got the auto-incremented ID and all that stuff that's been done for us. That's working just fine. I'm a big fan of MySQL, but you know, I hear that even uh, even Google moved away from MySQL from Ad for AdWords years ago. They they had a uh, they had global consistency problems. They wanted to make sure they had enough they had data that was visible across all their data centers across all the world, and they wanted to have externally consistent. Uh, distributed transactions. So I heard that they have this thing called Spanner, which sounds like a really smart idea. Yep. Uh, but as I understand it, I need uh, atomic clocks and GC GPS receivers. Right. Uh, and that sounds like a real, um, uh, yeah. doesn't sound like something I want to manage. Right. Uh, what yeah. can we do? Yeah, so, um, so we actually have uh, Spanner, the database that is globally available, globally distributed, strongly consistent relational database that you can use on, on the cloud, on GCP. It's called Cloud Spanner. Now, to use Cloud Spanner, sometimes you may have to use the API. But what we have done with Spring Cloud GCP is to actually integrate this with Spring Cloud Data, or Spring Data, uh, Spring Data for Spanner. So one of the things that we can do is actually, uh, why don't we go ahead and open up the, the pom.xml. And so what I'm going to do is to just get rid of some of these uh, MySQL stuff. So I'm going to say, uh, there we go. Maybe let me get rid of that uh, for now. And then the, the JDBC starter, we don't need that for the next one. And uh, I do need to uh, change out. The, um, mm -hmm. uh, the starter uh, right there. Wait, what happened? Oh, yeah. You control clicked on something. Uh, I did Man, your, um, your keyboard is so hard to use. I <laughs> there we go. So where did it go? Uh, let me open this up again. Palm like smell. All right, so uh, to use Spring Data, I'm going to switch out this dependency right here. I'm just going to use Starter, Data, and Spanner. Now, this starter is actually in a newer version of the, uh, the Spring Cloud GCP project. So I'm just going to update the project to 1.1.0. 1 .1 this is something you can actually try today as well. And that should bring in the right dependencies. Once we have that done, I can go back to this application. I can go back to this POJO. And I can actually just start to map this POJO into the spanner tables. So what that will allow you to do is to you know, not having to use the, the raw APIs when you don't actually need to. So the first thing that we're going to do is to just map it to a spanner table with the add table annotation. Uh, for the primary keys, we can use the spring ID annotation here. But because spanner may actually require you to use, use a composite key uh, for parent and children relationships, because we want you to use composite keys with multiple primary keys that has interleaving in between. So we actually have an additional annotation here for primary key. Uh, with a distributed database, uh, because we need to shard the data globally, uh, one of the things that we don't want you to do is to use a monotonically increasing ID. So the traditional long IDs you probably don't want to use anymore. And what we're going to use is going to be using a randomly generated uh, UUID instead. And of course, for the columns, we can map this to a column on the spanner table as well. But um, you know, sometimes the name doesn't match the name of the field. So we can also use the annotation here. For example, we can call it reservation underscore name. And that's really it. Now, we actually have to go and create this Spanner database. So I'm going to go back to the uh, console here. I'm going to just go and find uh, Spanner, the product. Oh, 
no, not that one. There we go, spanner. And let's see if we can find it. There we go. So we have no spanner instances here. I'm just going to go ahead and create one really, really quickly. I'm going to call it reservations demo, and that's going to give you an instance ID. Uh, here you have the options of uh, whether you want a global deployment or multi-regional deployment or regional deployment. I'm just going to be um, on the safe side here. I'm going to use a small deployment here with US Central 1. And then you can select the number of nodes that you want. Now, Spanner is horizontally scalable. Um, basically, each you node, know, there's a little guidance here that tells you how much load each of the nodes can actually handle. So a node can handle up to 10,000 QPS for the reads and 2,000 QPS for the write. If you need more, you just increase the number of uh, the nodes. And I'm just going to go ahead and create this new instance. Um, and once I get there, it's going to ask me to create a new database. So within the instance, I can create multiple databases. I'm just going to create a new database called Reservations, uh, similarly to what Josh has done. And we have this nice UI that you can actually use to create a table. I'm going to call it reservation table. If I don't make any mistakes, I'm going to create a new ID field here with the string as the, um, as the type. There we go. And UUID has 36 characters, so that's what I'm going to use. And let me just scroll down and make this not null. And I'm going to go ahead and create another ID uh, that is called the reservation name. Is that right? Yeah, and it's a string as well, not null. And then I can, of course, uh, continue and just make sure I have the primary key and click on create, and no, Ray, I should be doing it. Yep. Real developers don't use user interfaces. What's this about, man? What? Can, I, can I use text? Can I use a console? Yeah, actually, you can. So up here, you can actually edit as text, so we can actually show you the actual DDL that's necessary to create this table. And you can run this DDL against the Spanner database from a script or from an API when you're provisioning a new database. Okay. Yeah? So I'm going to go ahead and create it. And um, while it's creating, and that's done, reservations, I got everything right. All right, very cool. So to access this database, I'm going to be using Spring Data. Spring Data is really, really cool. So rather than writing a lot of the boilerplate code, uh, all I'm going to do is to create a new interface called Reservation Repository. There right, you go. And I'm going to extend the paging and sorting repository here uh, for the type of entity type of uh, reservation and the key type of a string. There we go. Oh, not that string. Wrong string. <laughs> Where did that even come from? Yeah, I, I do not know. There we go. All right. So there we go. And that is going to give you CRUD access to the Spanner database that has pagination support and sorting support just like that. So that's an interface. Spring Data will automatically provide an object at runtime that implements the interface and provides those methods for you. Yeah. So what I'm going to do then is to just show you how this repository works. I'm going to create a uh, Spanner runner that will implement the application runner as well, just like that. And um, I need to get used to you know, Josh's keyboard here with the implementation. And what I'm going to do is to just inject the uh, repository in. So I'm going to do private final, uh, what is it called? Reservation repository. I'm going to call it Ripple. And then, of course, I need to get this into the constructor. So there we go. Once I have the repository, uh, I can do all of the basic operations. So for example, I can delete all the records from the Spanner database if I want to on every startup of the application. You shouldn't do it, but I'm going to do it for the demo. And, and I'm going to also do a stream here of uh, maybe a few names. I'm going to say Josh, Hi. Ray, Hi. Uh, and uh, my awesome coworker Jisha as well. And for each of the names that we got, um, I'm going to do a map function here. And I'm going to create a new reservation object uh, like that. And because we need to generate this UUID string, I'm just going to generate the UUID through random UUID to string. And then I'm going to pass the name in, OK? And then for every one of these reservations that we created, I'm just going to map it to the repo save uh, method. So this is going to save the data into the spanner repository. Uh, and then for each one of them, I'm going to use my favorite logger in production, uh, which is system out uh, print line. This is what we do all the time. All right, very cool. And finally, the last piece of the puzzle is, well, Let's, I'm going to uh, just do the control Y, is that right? There yep, we go. There work. goes the GDBC stuff. And uh, we need to get rid of this import on the top as well, because I removed the dependency, right? So let me get rid of that. Um, and final piece of the puzzle is to actually connect to the Spanner database properly. So I'm going to, again, get rid of these things. And since I pull in the Spanner starter for Spring Data, uh, what I can do is to refer to the Spanner instance ID, which is reservations-demo. And then, of course, I need to uh, specify the database I'm trying to connect to, which is just reservations. And all of these should just connect up to Spanner with CRUD access, with object mapping. And I'm not very confident that this is just going to work. Is that simple? It should be yeah. just that simple. It's, it's hard to follow uh, right after you do. So you go, I'm going to stop, stop and rerun, and let's see if this actually works. Ooh, 
th this is really scary. So behind the scenes, we're establishing the authentication and connecting to Spanner. And this is trying to connect it via our conference Wi-Fi here. And there you go. There is a reservation object that is actually being stored in Spanner. Just to prove to you I didn't fake this, I'm going to go back to the database I just created. I'm going to go to the reservation table. And I'm going to go to the data. Here you can actually browse. And there we go. We got the data that we just created. Now, of course, Spring Data can do much, much more. Uh, if you want to create a service, I actually expose the spanner um, data via a RESTful interface. Uh, what I can do is go to go back to the repository here. And I just need to add an annotation here called the REST repository. Uh, there we go. Uh, where is it? Yeah, there we go. Repository REST resource. Yeah. So just by adding this one annotation, uh, all of the CRED functionalities can be exposed via a RESTful interface. I'm going to do another reload here. Uh, just stop and run. Yeah. Um, and it's going to restart the application. Again, reestablish the connection to Spanner, uh, and then expose this on the CRED interface. I'm just going to open up the terminal here. Hopefully, you can see it. Uh, I'm going to do curl uh, localhost uh, 8080. So this is what we are connected to. And you can see that we have an endpoint that is automatically uh, exposed. And we can go to reservations endpoint. And of course, I should be able to see all the Spanner data that I actually configured to map. Now, this is CRUD. What that means is you can also post into this endpoint, and it will save the data to Spanner in a global fashion. That's awesome. Oh, so now we have highly available, consistent, uh, globally available uh, state of you know, persistence and storage. Yeah. I can build the ultimate cat picture website. right? This is the kind of technology that we need in 2018. This is what we're here for. This is what we're bringing to bear. A whole warehouse full of computers is to be able to build cat picture websites at scale. So I know that as this site scales out, there's going to be more people that are going to connect to it. I'm going to have more uh, services. Surely this is just the beginning of a long and wonderful journey to production. And we're going to have other microservices that are going to talk to each other. As we add more users to the system, we deluge the system with more traffic, we're going to see more people uh, hitting the surface. And we're going, to be able, we're going to want to know how requests flow from one node to another in the system, how they move from one microservice to another. And this is a very common use case, especially as you start to conduct more and more data over the wire using microservices. You need to be able to understand where something happened, right? You've heard, the, uh, you've heard it said before that moving to microservices is like making every production incident a murder mystery. We have to figure out what happened, right? We need to understand where latency is. We need to find out where there's a problem. And one way to do this is to use distributed tracing as popularized, uh, you know, fittingly, uh, by the Dapper paper published by Google back in 2011. Distributed tracing, in theory, is very simple. For every request that e enters or exits the system, at every ingress or egress in the system, we have a unique ID that gets added to the message if it's not there already, and it gets perpetuated if it is there. So we take a message, look at the unique ID, and then we make sure that we send another outgoing message, we, we add that same ID. That correlation ID allows us to then you know, record the, the, the receipt of that message and then see where that message has been later on. Right? We can publish information about where that message has been later on. In theory, it's very simple. But imagine all the things you have to do to uh, instrument all your code to be aware of this. Well, in Spring Cloud, we have an SPI called Spring Cloud Sleuth. Sleuth, like a detective, right? like a Sherlock Holmes. Spring Cloud Sleuth is a distributed tracing SPI. And there are different implementations of which I think uh, uh, the uh, Spring Cloud GCP Google Cloud Stack Trace Stack Driver, Stack Driver Trace implementation is one of the best. So we're going to use that here for our, uh, our application. Uh, I need to go to my build and add Spring Cloud GCP Starter Trace. And we'll add the Org Spring Framework Cloud dependencies as before. I did, what is Sadiq uh, Framework? Yeah, Spring Santa Maria. All right, here we're almost there, almost there. Look at that. OK, so we've got now Spring Cloud GCP starter trace. That's on the console. It's on the build. That's really all I need to do. But remember, it's going to plug into Spring Cloud Sleuth. By default, Spring Cloud Sleuth captures one out of every 10 requests. Because you're not going to see, you're not going to need to see every single request in order to understand what's happened. Remember, this is all about online telemetry, what's happening right now. And you'll see the emergent behavior of your system in the patterns. You don't need to, you don't need to nor should you want to, capture every single request of every single node in the logging system. Instead, uh, it's by default ratcheted down to 1 out of every 10, or 0.1. But we're going to ratchet it up to 1.0 so that we can, uh, in our stage demo here, see everything quickly. Now, I'm going to drive some traffic uh, to this endpoint uh, using a trace runner, which is just going to be a thing that implements application runner. And we'll use the Spring Framework REST template. Now, the REST template 
is another template object, like the JBC template that we looked at earlier, that allows us to make easy REST calls, uh, HTTP calls to other services. And I'm going to factory an instance of that bean. I'm going to tell Spring to vend an instance of that bean, of this object, in this factory method. So Spring's going to see this bean, and it's going to see that we have Spring Cloud Sleuth on the class path. It's going to instrument this client, this HTTP client, uh, with an interceptor that is aware of outgoing requests. So now I can say uh, for int i equals 0, i is less than 10, i plus plus. Uh, and then I'm just going to say this dot rest template dot get for entity HTTP localhost 8080 forward slash reservation. So I'm going to call myself basically, and I'm going to tell Spring Cloud Sleuth, I'm going to tell the rest template rather to give me a payload of type string back. So the result will be this here. And I'm just going to log that out system out result, result like so. Now, that's going to be fine, but remember, we're making requests uh, from a service on the command line, basically. When the application starts up, there's no trace context at the moment. So I'm going to simulate a trace context. Normally, you'd have that. If you had, if you had one microservice with a REST API calling another, you'd see that. But we don't have that here. So I'm going to tell Spring Cloud Sleuth to initiate a span, right? Trace client. In tracing parlance, you have the trace, which is the aggregate journey of all the requests going from A to Z, right? From A to B to C to D. That whole thing is called, it's, it's just one trace. You have one trace ID. Each hop in the journey, each leg of the journey, is called a span. So you have multiple span IDs and one trace ID. So there we go. I started the application. Uh, I made a number of different requests. You can see that all here reflected in the console. Now, if we go back to Google Cloud, oh, I'm going to search for it. Yeah, there you go. Trace. Awesome. Yeah. Trace list. Sure, that works too. Deep dive. So you can see that I've got one request, or I've got an a overarching request that starts with that trace client and then a number of subordinate requests right, that were executed in successive order. So if I click on this, I can see the top trace client thing took 1.7 seconds, uh, seconds to make all those requests. And then I, I can see pairs. Here's the outgoing thing and the response. Outgoing thing and response. If I look at that, I can see the timestamps, the, the headers, the context about the request, what endpoint it hit. And if I had enabled stack, stack driver trace logging, uh, then I would see correlated logging here as well. I'd see view logs. So here we have all that on the, con on the console readily available just for our uh, dependency in the application. Now, that said, I've got tracing, and, and it's working just fine. Now I have observability. I can see more or less what's happening at the, in the system at runtime. Now, I can feel a little bit more confident when I want to integrate this with other services out there. Globally consistent and globally available, though Spanner is, the last thing I want is to hand out credentials to uh, partners and other people that need to depend upon my API for them to get my data. Instead, I'd much prefer to broadcast that data so that they can consume it in their applications. And here, this is a natural case for messaging or integration. There's a lot of good options out there. I could, were I so inclined, stand up a, 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 an, a, you know, an a, a Apache Kafka cluster, certainly. But there's a very nice choice here in Google Cloud called Google Cloud Pub Sub. So I'm going to use that instead. And it's fairly straightforward. We're going to go to our build. And we're going to add Spring Cloud GCP Starter Pub Sub Org Spring Framework Cloud. And now I'm going to build a thing that's going to start up and produce some messages, and another thing that's going to start up and uh, consume the message. Let's create a REST controller here at REST controller, producer, REST controller. And whenever somebody hits this endpoint, we're going to make it a get because. You know, no time for a post. And we're going to say that we want to send void, publish, and we're going to use the pub sub template. So I'm going to say private final pub sub template. And the template uh, I'll inject into my constructor as normal. And I'll say this dot template dot publish. I'm going to send it to a topic called reservations, which I haven't yet initialized. And we'll come back to that. And the message I'll send is hello name, right? And the name is the uh, path variable here in the method uh, definition. So path variable string name. There we are. And this returns a listenable future of type string. So I'm going to actually assign that result to my method here. And I'll just tell Spring to manage that for me. So I'll say return this, that, that. Okay. Now that's my producer. On the consumer side, I'm going to have a consumer runner that implements application runner. And the consumer runner uh, is going to start up and it's going to take advantage of the pub sub tem template here to subscribe. So I'll say at subscribe uh, in this method. And I'll register a message listener. So this template subscribe, and I'm going to subscribe to the reservations subscription. So these are not the same thing. There's a decoupling uh, between the uh, thing which you can, which you pull for re for messages, and the thing that actually uh, takes incoming messages, in just versus uh, you know out whatever. So 
we're going to print out the message. Received this message, dot get data, dot two string UTF-8. And then we're going to explicitly acknowledge the consumption of the message. Otherwise, that message will get re-delivered later on. So I'm going to take care of that now. Now, before we can run this code, interesting though it is, we need to actually uh, configure these topics and, su and uh, subscriptions here in Google Cloud PubSub. So I'm going to go down here to um, PubSub down there. Here we are. And I'm going to go to the topics uh, column. And I'm going to create a topic called reservations, which is what we said we had. Create that. And then that, that's going to need a corresponding subscription. So I'll create a new subscription. And that's going to be called reservation subscription. And uh, I'll hit create. Once, with that in place, I have everything I need to be able to run this application. Let's go ahead and give it a go and see what we get. So now, once that's up and running, I can hit curl localhost 8080 forward slash publish forward slash Google next. All right, is that good? Yeah, I think so. Looks OK. Yeah, is it running? There we oh, go. Wow, we got a response. Did yeah. I? Uh, Did you uh, add the uh, component for the runner? Yeah, there it is, consumer runner. Did I misspell something? Oh, I did misspell something. It's, yeah, here, I spent, I said res reservations, subscriptions. Okay, ah, there we go. There awkward, you. very oh, awkward. Yeah. Sorry about that. That's, that's not too bad for um, just making a simple mistake like that. We well, that's, that. that's awkward. Yeah. I, well. <laughs> I could do better. These cat picture websites won't get to production with that kind of, uh, that kind of <laughs> sloppy coding. So there we go. Oh, by the way, you saw the missed message. There's the message that I, that I uh, it's been retroactively consumed. Come on. Yeah. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, there, there it is. There's that. Yeah. There's hello next. Now I'm going to send it again because I've got it queued. And we should see if we go down here. There it is again, there right? So That's there we go. Bad. That's not yeah. bad. Not bad. Pretty good. Pretty good. Now, of course, we have a lot of different uh, functionalities here that you can actually use Spring with. Um, and the, the, um, uh, if Spring has an abstraction for it, uh, we would love to have some kind of a nice layer underneath it so that you can consume the GCP services very easily. We saw it for Spanner. Uh, we actually have other, in other integrations for configurations, for accessing cloud storage so you can store as much data as you want. Uh, but if you don't have that kind of abstraction, if you want to use some kind of API uh, just out of the box from Google Cloud, uh, you can actually do that too. So for example, uh, there's no abstraction to use a vision API, for that matter, to analyze uh, the pictures that you can upload. So what I'm going to do is to, uh, for example, uh, consume the vision API that we have. So the first thing that we need to do is to actually add the dependency uh, for using that client library. And that's pretty easily done. All I need to do is come back here. I'm going to use the Google Cloud Vision API to do this. So there we go, vision, vision, yep. And it's going to be under uh, com.google cloud. There we go. And because all the dependencies are being managed by the bomb, what that means is that we manage all the compatible versions for you. So you don't have to explicitly declare any versions here. Uh, we will transitively import anything that's necessary uh, in order for this API to work. So once I have this API imported, then I can go ahead and use Spring to potentially uh, factory a client. So I'm going to go back here. I'm going to use the Bing annotation here. I'm going to produce a image annotator client. This is the client I need to use to talk to the Vision API. So I'm going to call it the image annotation client. Um, and of course, I can go ahead and return this client uh, as is. But our starter actually can figure out the environment that you're running in. And because we have Google App Engine, we've got Kubernetes Engine, we've we got local environments, you might be running this on-prem for that matter. So what we do is we automatically try to understand what credentials we can use. And it will give you this thing called the credentials provider so that you can use it to bootstrap your client libraries with the right credentials that you configured for your Spring application. So I'm going to go ahead and use this. So I'm going to create a Spring annotated client. I'm going to make sure that I've got the settings in there. So this is the only thing that you have to do, which is to use a custom setting. And I'm going to set the credential provider uh, just like that. And it's going to you know, add an exception here. Now, here's the thing. This client is actually a heavy client. What that means is that we try to keep the singleton. And however, it does implement auto-closable. What that means is that when the Spring Boot application stops, we'll automatically shut down the clients and close all the connections for you. So all of these thing things will just work. Now, to test this thing out, I'm going to also create a little controller here uh, with the REST controller. I'm going to call it, uh, what should we call it, Vision Controller. How's that? Yep. Yeah. And I'm going to also, uh, for this one, we actually need the post mapping. So I'm going to call it Vision. So I'm going to try to create a controller that I can post a picture to. right? And this is going to return, let's say, return a string. And I'm going to call this Vision. 
and um, I'm going to take in the, the image upload as a parameter. And to upload a file in Spring, what you need to do is to use multi-part file, and then I can code this image, and that's it. Now, within here, I can also go ahead and just inject the, uh, the client I just created. So I'm going to do private final uh, image annotator client. There we go. I'm just going to code this the client. And then, of course, I need to uh, get this into the constructor as well. Uh, there we go. OK. So from the client, this old bootstrap, this will just connect up to the, the, um, the client, uh, sorry, for the Vision API. So what I can do is I can go ahead and say client batch annotate the image. And from here, I need a list. So we can use collections dot singleton list. And I need to pass in an annotate image request. So we got to use the builders here. So what is in this request? Well, we need to set the image. So this image will have uh, the bytes that we just uploaded. So we need to use this builder for the image. And then we need to, again, set the content. And that is a byte string, which I'm going to copy the bytes from the image here to get bytes. And that's pretty much it. Now, there are many different things that the Vision API can do uh, for those. Uh, for example, we can detect what's inside the pictures. We can actually extract text from the image as well. For every one of those, we can just add a feature detection uh, necessary for this uh, particular functionality. So I'm going to go ahead and just add a feature uh, that will detect the labels, so basically understanding what is inside the picture. So for that one, I'm just going to do uh, label detection. Of course, I can add more, but that's pretty much it. Now, this is going to return the response. I'm going to convert it to a string, and I'm just going to return this from the endpoint. The API, just, the API just rolls right off the tongue. Look at just very yeah. clean <laughs> API. Look at that. Yeah. Yeah. So, what is happening? So let's see if this actually will work. So if, when this uh, application restarts, we should have a vision endpoint that will take a file upload. Uh, and, but then for that, we need a picture. I, yep. Do you have one? I do, my friend. Yeah. I've got one right here. I'm going to you have it? desktop cat. Of course. So let's look at the picture. So we know what we're dealing with here. It, it's a it's a cat. It's a it's a cat, everybody. It's a it's a cat. Yeah. Okay. That's that's very nice. Yeah. What, what do we get? Oh, Wikipedia. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Wikipedia. <laughs> there we go. So there you go. So okay. there's that. So you know what you know how to find it. It's on the desktop there. Yeah. All right. So there you go. I'm gonna just go to the desktop here. Uh, so that's easy. I'm gonna do a curl dash f. So that is going to upload the cat picture, read from the the file system, and I'm gonna post it to the vision endpoint. And of course, nobody thinks this would just work. Neither do I. But oh, there we go. So we just posted this picture to the endpoint, which then talked to the Vision API uh, that's bootstrap by Spring. And we can actually see that it detected that this is 99% a cat. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. It's a small to medium sized cat as well. It's a cat like memo, but I'm pretty sure it's a cat. Yeah. Yeah. But, sure. but we can also see the, the type of the cat is 63% sure that it's a European short hair. Right. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah. That was pretty cool. Well, right on. Yeah. They, oh. Our cat picture website is uh, getting better and better. Now, that's it. I think we're missing some important stuff. We're mi what, missing what? some important stuff. First yep. of all, this is an enterprise cloud scale you know, uh, kind of application. Wouldn't be much of an application if we didn't have a suitable ASCII banner. So I'm going to make sure that we, uh, we address that right now uh, by adding a custom banner.txt to my application. Curl, downloads, reservation service. Source main resources. Now, the, the banner is the, the thing that you see when you start the application. Yes, right? we'll fix yeah. that right here. Okay. So there we go. We have good ASCII banners already. You can see in the application, when the application starts up, it says spring, right? Right there. It's very, very well done. But that said, sometimes people want to change it, and that's okay. If you want to change it, uh, you should feel free. And I just showed you how I'm going to copy that text file. I've got this text file here called banner.txt, right? It's in, my, it's in my application directory. I'm going to now go to the command line here, CD downloads. Reservation service, maven clean, spring hyphen boot, colon run. Wait. <laughs> that, not bad, right? I, I control seed it so we can see the results. There's an ion cat. Getting better, getting better. Uh, I think that's a, a, good a good thing, a good feature, an addition to our cloud native system. That thing, there is, that said, there is one more thing I'd like to talk about. Just. Just one more thing. We, uh, we, you may have heard about Knative. Anybody here hear about Knative in the last few days? Yeah. yeah. So we at Pivotal have been working very closely with our friends here at Google. Uh, and we've got a, a project called RIF. RIF is for functions. Get it? RIF is for functions. It's, an, it's a recursive acronym, friends. Don't think too much about it. Your head will explode. Uh, it's, a, it's for functions. It's a function as a service platform built Knatively on top of Knative. Uh, and it, uh, 
uh, we, we debuted it the day of the launch, right? As soon as there was a, the ability to talk about it publicly, we, we released the version that's built on top of it. And that platform is available. It's open source. It's a patch 2 license. You can download it from projectrift.io. It's here. Uh, and the docs, of course, speak to how to run it on local machine, on Minikube, and on GKE, right? Which is a nice place to run uh, your, your uh, workloads. So we have uh, GKE-based Riff on top of Knative. I've got that running in our Google Cloud account, my Google Cloud uh, console that's, just, that's already deployed. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to deploy a function-based application to this work to this uh, this runtime. Now I've got a couple examples here. I'm going to go to my console. Let's uh, let's clean up some of the noise here. I've got a couple examples here. I'm going to go to my desktop. And I'm going to look at uh, the the beautiful GCP Riff function. I'm going to open this up in my IDE, and this is a Spring Cloud Function based application. Spring Cloud Function is an abstraction that allows you to write functions that work uh, in, a, in, a, in an agnostic way, independent of any particular function runtime. So you can use, uh, what's that other company in Seattle? Um, BWS, something like that. that. That other company, they have functions as well. Uh, that other one, the other one in Redmond, they have, one, they have functions as well. And of course, uh, Riff is a great choice, right? So we, uh, Riff is, a, I think, the most interesting option here. We're going to open up this Spring Cloud function-based application. Normally, in order to run your functions on these uh, other platforms, you need an adapter, but you don't need that for this. So we have a very simple function that allows you to take a string. Uh, it's literally just a Java util function. It's a Java 8 function API. So we're going to say, given a string in, uppercase it. Very, very simple, trivial example. Uh, and I, I simplified it down to a lambda like this, right? That's what that does. And then I simplified it yet again to a method reference like that. So very, very trivial, you know, globally scalable uppercase thing, OK? So there's a simple example. Now I'm going to deploy this to Riff uh, here. I've got a little script called uh, build. And what build is going to do is it's going to, all this is to say I'm going to build it, copy the jar to the root of the directory, check it in. Then I'm going to get my project ID for Google Cloud. I've got a function name. It's called uppercase. I'm going to delete the function with Riff if it's already existing. And then I'm going to create a new one here using Riff function create Java, passing in the name of the function, pointing it to the Git repository, because that's the way Knative works. It's one of the ways Knative works. Uh, we're pointing it to the artifact, which in this case is the jar. And we're telling it to run the handler called uppercase. Now, uppercase is the bean name here, right? The Spring Cloud function bean. Uh, and then we're telling it to pull the image from the Google container repository. Uh, and the, the URL here. So let's run this script. It'll build and it'll deploy. And um, actually, this is actually a Spring Boot application, right? Yeah, it's a Spring Boot application. So everything we've looked at, Spring Cloud GCP, all these things, you can use within that function. You can call them just like you would any other Spring Boot best based application. Now, the application's up and running. Uh, we can see Rift service list. OK, there's uh, some. Knative is really new yet, my friends, so there's some weirdness there. But we can see that it's got uppercase. Now I'm going to say kubectl, git pods. And uh, we can see it says uppercase. And we've got three, zero out of three. So git pods again, three yeah, out of three. Yeah. So now I'm going to run this, this application uh, using riff run. And this one's actually fairly straightforward. I'm going to say I've got a function named uppercase. I want to call the function gateway using this command line. But you could just as easily call your, get the URL and the host and the port, uh, and then send a, send a request to it using curl or something else. So I'm going to say invoke that, that function, passing in a payload of type hello knative, and get the result back. So let's try this. Run, riff run, curl, and there we go. We got hello knative. Not bad, huh? Yeah, I mean, it, it's just uppercase. Huh? It's very, yeah, well, yeah, well, but it's just uppercasing a few strings, a few bytes. I mean, is that what you use serverless for? I've got a whole warehouse full of computers if I want to just uppercase strings, that's what I want to do. What else? What? <laughs> well, can, can you uppercase something else? I mean, what else can you do with this I, thing? I can uppercase a cat. What? Yeah. The, so, the cat picture that we just had? Yeah. Not, not the word cat, but the, the actual uh, picture the cat, of a yeah. cat. How, how do you do that? OK, so we've got another function here, desktop, upper cat. Upper cat? Yeah. Totally so, different. Totally different application. So what do you do? Is and there an upper cat function that you can code from G, the GDK? Yep, and you yeah. can too. So I'm going to build it just as before. We'll hit build. OK, so it's going to deploy just as before, get push, all so that you, stuff. So you're pushing an uppercat function. Yeah, well, I, you know, it's, it's open source. Others are free to use it. So now if we go to kubectl git pods, we'll see that it's uh, spinning up init 3 of 4. Yeah, do a watch. Watch, yeah. There we go. OK, now we're cooking. Yeah. <laughs> 
All okay, right. there we go. Initializing. Now, what, uh, what does that actually do? How do you uppercase a cat? I well, uh, this th there's a lot of. It's very sophisticated, Ray. It's very right, complicated. Right, I'm not sure you'd right, understand it. Just no, I don't. I don't. Don't think worry. I would. Yeah. Okay, so it's it's deployed. Okay, we've got this application. We've got three of three instances of the uppercat service in the cloud. Uh, now I'm going to invoke it. So I'm going to say uh, riff run, same thing. And here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say riff service invoke uppercat, passing in header, content type, text plane. Uh, I'm sending the bytes. It doesn't really matter. I'm sending the bytes from this file, cat.jpg. It's the same one, right? So open yeah. this. There it is. In, in, that's the same cat, OK? It's the same cat, the poor cat. Look at him. Look at him, that, that scaredy cat right there. So I'm going to send that cat into the cloud and be you know, transformed, OK? So cat riff run. OK, and then I'm, once the data comes out, it's going to be output to JSON. There's a key in the JSON called cat. I'm going to un. I'm going to extract that key with JQ and then pass it to base64 to decode it and then output that to a JPEG file, which I don't have here, right? So there's a no uppercat JPEG. All right, you ready? <laughs> I'm hoping yeah. this will work. I'm hoping this works too. I don't know what magic you have behind this. Okay. Yep. Well, We're done. That the was machine, fast. That was really The machine really is done. And there it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very good. Very nice. Very nice. That's how you uppercase a cat. You did. I got yep. it. I now, got it. We have an application. Uh, it's good. It's good. Yeah. But I think we do need one, one more thing. Yeah. One more thing. I, I like the ASCII art that we looked at before. OK. Yeah. But I do want to improve upon it. It's sure. 2018. Yeah. And we can uppercase cats. <laughs> we can do anything. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace the ASCII art one more time, since we have the time, with an animated GIF. Because you know that's how I roll. <laughs> so. Curl downloads reservation service source main resources banner.gif. Do you need to get rid of the, uh, the previous? I piece. think I do, yeah. Awkward. <laughs> banner.txt. All right, now back. Maven clean spring hyphen boot call and run. Let me try that again. Huh? <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. Now, uh, uh, it does take a few it, seconds to start, doesn't it? Yeah, I know that. I know it takes like 30 <laughs> seconds to start up. I don't even care. Totally worth it. Absolutely worth it. You should be stopping your production grade applications and updating them with AskArt right now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, my friend. Yeah. I think we're just about out of time. Yeah, but uh, we just do about have a few uh, out of last time. slides that we got. So let's take a look at. Uh, let's go back. What did you have? The thing uh, right here. There we are. Yeah. So we went through quite a few things today. A few. Um, yeah, just a few. Uh, there are a number of different starters you can actually use. Uh, like I said, configuration and storage, uh, logging. So what we can do is to correlate your logs directly with Trace as well. All of these are fully integrated with Spring and Spring Boot. Uh, and there's uh, tons of resources you can use. Uh, we have the project homepage, the documentation, the source code and examples. We got short code lab. We got the long code lab. We have a boot camp tomorrow as well. If you're welcome to join. Uh, and of course, we have other things from uh, Project Riff and um, and Josh's favorite place after production, which is start.spring.io. We'll take any questions. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Thank you.